Yo, brother, how's it, man? Yeah, man, it's always good to be yeah. alive. It's know? a new day, man, it's a new day. Um, welcome, guys. Welcome to our viewers, those who are returning and those who are new. Uh, guys, look, I really want to send a deep, deep, deep gratitude and appreciation for each and every one of you. Whether a video has 300 views or 10 views or even one view, I really, really deeply appreciate you guys. Please tune in. We try our best to keep this content the highest possible quality and to be as factual as possible. But feel free to engage with us. Feel free to comment. Feel free to disagree, you know. This is not a safe space where you have to agree with everything. Disagree, criticize, scrutinize, but let's engage, guys. So um, please uh, be on board, stay with us, and please subscribe and share. <laughs> so, brother, um, there's an interesting subject that I'd like for us to look at, you know. Um, university protests, particularly university protests in South Africa. Maybe we can look at it in a three... Uh, uh, in a set of three, right, from the history of protests uh, among students into how we transitioned into this new era of the ANC and democracy and then how things have been since 2015. Because 2015 was a very critical year for student protests in this country and how things have unfolded up to now, right? So, protests, so education in South Africa, man, it's very important that we start at the very beginning, right? So, um, Europeans came to South Africa, I mean, as far back as the 1300s. Europeans were already here. But obviously, the, a lot of them were shipwreck survivors along the coasts of the Eastern Cape and KZN. Mozambique as well, you know, shipwreck survivors. We had a lot of Portuguese as well who came in the 1400s. Um, so, 1300s, 1400s, I think even 1200s, you know. In the Cape, there were a lot of Europeans who used to come. But then the settlement now, the settlers, those ones came around the 1600s. And then they stayed in what they called uh, the Cape of Good Hope, which is uh, what is now known as Cape Town, which is not the real Aboriginal name of the place. But that's be besides the point. So when these guys came, right, they obviously wanted to establish a community. And that means now they had to come with their belief system and their value system. And therefore, they imported a lot of missionaries. These missionaries, their primary objective was to get people to follow their belief system, their value system. But also, they operated like uh, CIA operatives. So they operated like spies. So they were in charge of how people viewed the world, how people viewed the Europeans. Um, so they would question things like the people's um, Aboriginal belief system, people's languages, people's names. Then they would come and infiltrate the culture and put on that European uh, Christianized worldview. But with a European um, element to it, because that's not really Christianity, it's just the European element. So the missionaries were very central and they were like the closest thing. That they are the closest group of Europeans to us. You see, they came and lived in our communities. And to show how civilized our kings and chiefs were, these guys, they stayed, man, rent-free. They stayed, they had land, the missionaries. Even though there were wars between European governors and, you know, Aboriginal kings, they, the missionaries were never killed. They just stayed. They were there and they were accepted. That's how civilized our people were. Not knowing, unfortunately, that these missionaries had another mission. But the reason why I'm mentioning missionaries is that they came with the belief system, but also with the education system. So what happened is, in the initial days, when the government was not really in charge, when the European government, under the Dutch East India Company, and then later under the colonial, imperial British uh, 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 government, the government was not really involved in the education of the Aboriginal people. So the missionaries came and established mission schools or mission centers. To this day, if you go to some traditional churches or people who go to the Zionist churches, um, they, they refer to the, the, the main church house as the mission or the mission temple because that's how it came through. You would have a mission center and then everyone would go there for school. Then that's where they then used that access to European education. They used it to brainwash people. For example, Nelson Mandela was brainwashed in Lovedale College, College amongst other places. And I think in Hilltown as well, which is where I'm from. Lovedale and Hilltown are both where I'm from, in what is now known as Alice, but the, the real name is Etigain. So Nelson Mandela was brainwashed there. 
Hence, he got the name Nelson. What do you mean the real name, bro? No, the real name of the place is Etikeni. But then the English or colonized, colonized version of the name is Alice, Eastern Cape. Those are not the real names, man. But that's beside the point. The schooling system, <laughs> private school, the idea of private school came with the missionaries. That's what private schools came from, with the missionaries. That's why you have St. John's College, St. Stephen's House. So, 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 a lot of them are named after, you know, um, saints, European saints, Anglican saints, Catholic saints, because these were mission houses or buildings or church buildings, you see. So that's the origin of schooling in this country. And at that time, there was no public school or private school. It was just private school. Everyone had access to it. Black people had access to private school, man. Many a times, even before, some white kids had access to it. Because remember, the, the, the Dutch, the Boers, they didn't really want to be under the control of the Dutch East India Company. They ran away from the Dutch East India Company. That's why they came to places like George, places like Paul, places like Worcester. You see, that's why they went to the Eastern Cape. They were running away from the taxes. Because the Dutch in the company doesn't play. Those, those are the real slave masters. They were even enslaving their own people, the Dutch. They were enslaving the, the French Huguenots. So they ran away from that. So they didn't really have access to the resources of the company. And therefore you'd find that a lot of the people who accessed private education first were black people, the children of the chiefs, the royal kids. And Europeans did this, not just in South Africa. If you go to the Congo, if you go to Angola, in those kingdoms that were there, you see, Kingdom of Congo under King Alfonso, so-called Alfonso. You find that they did the same to the children of the king. They would send the children of the king to Portugal. They would, the, the, they would send the children of the kings to France. In the 1600s, man, in the 1700s, they went and studied in these prestigious institutions. But then the goal was to sort of like separate them, apartheid, separate them from themselves, which is the real core of apartheid. Apartheid is not about separating you from white people, but really separating you from reality it's, it's like a plot to destabilize the absolutely community. absolutely mm. so that's that's what this um education system did when it came you had to get a new name you had to be baptized you had to profess that you're serving this particular deity of theirs and therefore you started to learn now my mother who was born in 1955 she knows greek history like nobody's business yeah. i never learned greek history but i know greek history today it was like, history we were taught as well. You see, my mother will tell you about Heracles, <laughs> who the people called Hercules. Hercules. Yes, she will tell you about the bull of Minos. Yes. She knows these things because she was taught in Lovedale College, back in the Eastern Cape, in those post-colonial, post-missionary house type of schools, where Nelson Mandela also went. You see, that's how efficient and effective those uh, missionary-style schools were. And that's how school started. That's how the idea of private school started. And then it, met, um, it morphed into this semi-private way called Model C schools. When the apartheid government came through, they wanted to empower their people. But then... What, 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 what do you actually think motivated like, black people to go to those schools? I think black people, men, have always been very curious. So remember when the missionaries came, they, they came with peace, man. Or with purported peace. At least that's what our people saw. They saw peace. So they came peacefully. They didn't come to... They didn't insult the people, you see. They traded with our people for a very long time. They even stayed. They established clans and families. They married in the local communities. That's why you have clans like Abelungu in, in Koha, in what they call Eliodale today. That's why you have clans like Amanges in the Eastern Cape. You had clans like Scotchy people who, are, who descend from Scottish. When these people came, they were welcomed. And therefore the missionaries had a story to tell. And people were like, let's hear you, let's hear you out, you see. Our people were not like, no, we're not going to listen to you, pale man. Uh -uh. They're like, let's hear this guy out. Maybe he has a point. And therefore the missionaries started to preach. They started to preach. And our people started learning more about where these people come from. Then they would tell our kings that, no, we have a king as well. His name is George, King George. Her name is Victoria, you see. And then our people started to learn about these guys. Now, the, the loophole was that the kingdoms were not dictatorships. I've said this before. They were much more semi-autonomous structures that had uh, like a federation of semi-autonomous structures. So you'd have a group of Kosa people known as the Kosa Kingdom. But within the Kosa Kingdom, you had Amagwali, you had Imidange, 
you had ama velelo, you had ama mbalu, you had ama kalega, you had ama khakhabe, ama ngika. All these semi-autonomous groups are led by royal princes, you see. All of them report to one king, the king of Amagdalega. But then they, they have their independence, a very significant amount of independence. But maybe they would need a king's permission when it comes to land distribution, you see, mm. on serious matters like that. But then in a lot of things, they govern themselves. So or when they have like uh, big ceremonies. Yes, when they have big ceremonies. And during the first fruit ceremony, they all went to pay tribute to the king. Yeah. But then that semi-autonomous now, that freedom of autonomy, self-governance, it meant that when the missionaries would go to Amangaiga, the Amangaiga didn't need permission from the king to liaise with these Europeans. They liaised with them to such a point that King Niga himself of the Amakosa gave away a lot of land, man. He gave away a lot of land, actually, uh, to such a point that there are poems, traditional poems that have been said about him, uh, so, Niga. So considering that um, <clears throat> The, the Europeans were actually given land by kings. Yeah, they uh, were. Back in the days. And um, considering the fact that there's this um, thing called the... Um, uh, what, what you call this? Expropriation. Expropriation of land without compensation. Um, so where do we actually draw the line between that? Because now we find that there are actually white uh, settlers who were given land. Yeah. Like, yeah, I know. I, I hear you. No, I don't think there's going to be any drawing of the line. Remember, expropriation, the way it's proposed by the EFF, they will expropriate everything from everyone. Not just white or black. Everyone, no one will have land. Land will belong to the state. You will lease land if you need it. So they are rewriting the whole thing. If you believe in it, then you can vote for the EFF and then they will do it. So there's no drawing of the line whether hey, the king was gave this one. Uh -uh. Remember, even the kings now, they are meaningless under expropriation. Even the land of the king is being expropriated, <laughs> which is crazy. But let's go back to the missionary school. So when these guys came, right, they didn't force anyone to follow their agenda. They just presented their story. Look, this is what we have. And they came with whatever they came with. Utensils, pots, European pots, not our traditional pots. We do have traditional pots, but they came with European pots, which seemed to be a little bit easier to use. You see, they came with blankets. You, you know this traditional blanket called Ingawa. You know Ingawa is actually skin, animal skin, the original Ingawa. But then nowadays Ingawa is a European blanket. All these things that we are wearing that are European, the traditional, we had a traditional alternatives to them. We had a traditional underwear, a traditional blanket, traditional head. It's just that I think our people saw, saw it as a little bit easier to use some of these European things, especially after war. You see, after war, when they would be conquered, then they wouldn't have access to these wild animals, you see. They wouldn't have access to these patches of land, so they, they would have to buy. But back to how the Europeans established these schools. So they come, they're welcomed, they tell their story, and then they, 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 they sell the idea of educating children. That, you know, children should be educated. Uh, certain skills will be taught to them. Writing. You see, they taught them to write. But in reality, you know, writing was always there because even the word to write, we have a traditional word for it. Ukupala. It's not a word that we borrowed from someone. We already had it. Except that we wrote in stone. We wrote on the walls through pictorial language, like the hieroglyphics of Egypt. That's why when you go to the walls, you see pictures everywhere. You go to the painting of the houses, you see pictures. A lot of them have hidden messages. But then they taught people to write in the, in the Latin. And there's also like writings in the um, shaman caves. Um, the, those, um, hot, they call them hot Oh, uh, Kwekwen, Kwekwena, Kwekwena writings. Also, they used to actually um, draw. I mean, the most, well. the most ancient writing system in the world is here in South Africa. The most ancient, estimated to be 60,000 old, 60,000 years old, in, in some caves here in South Africa. I think it's Deep Kloof Caves, I'm not sure, but it's some, 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 a name like that. So we, they taught them to write in the European style, using the European style of books. Because remember, the original book, is a leather scroll. You take animal skin and then you remove the fur, then you write on it with, with ink. You know the original ink most? It's uh, what we call in Chongo. When you smoke a pipe, that black thing, sooth, yes. That black thing, you use it like ink. That's the original ink that we used to use. Hmm? They iron it. Yeah, so you can even use um, a feather. You take the sooth, you use feather, and then you write on a leather a patch. That's a scroll. There's no other definition of a scroll. Or you can take a papyrus 
Umtlanga, you played it, you weave it together with another umtlanga, it creates a page. You write on it. But anyway, so our people accepted this schooling system, especially the children of the chiefs, you see. But then, these missionaries didn't just come alone. There were constant fights and wars, and then our people saw the guns, they wanted the guns. Anyway, f fast forward now to under the apartheid regime. So what the apartheid regime did is that they realized, mm -mm, these people are being educated in private schools, basically. Because these private schools are colonial schools that came with the missionaries. So what the apartheid... Are you saying there were no other schools besides private schools back then? There were, schools were private, yes. It's what we call private schools now. Back then, it was the, the only schools that we had. Mm. Remember, these Dutch people stayed in farms, so they didn't really send their kids to school. <laughs> A lot of them, even to this day, they don't like school, actually. Yeah. yeah, they don't like school. The guys who stayed in farms, they don't like school at all. So what the apartheid government did, they realized, mm -mm, our people have been oppressed by the British. Eh? Oppressed. In, to whatever extent that happened. So what they did is that they devised a plan to create an education system that catered to Afrikaners, right? And then made sure that the blacks who had previously had access to this high level of, according to European standards, of education, they made sure that they pressed them under the Bantu Education Act. I think it's an act of 1953, where they ensure that the education that our people have access to is the education that teaches them to obey, that teaches them to take instructions, doesn't teach them to manage power or to even re, uh, um, sort of like create. You see, they were not creators, they were not managers, but rather they were uh, ex doers, laborers. Just at that point, why, why do you think they actually call this Bantu education instead we? of anything else? Well, it was specifically designed for Abantu and not any other species. Remember, um, so Afrikaners, they have a different view of things. They, don't, they didn't really see us as black or whatever. This thing of black came with the Americans, right? The Afrikaners, they understood you are Kosa, you are Zulu, you are this, you are that. And then they realized, no man, all of these people are Abandu, that's their species. We are not Abandu. The Afrikaners are not Abandu. They are Abelungu. That's what we call them. Some people even go further to differentiate between Abelungu as European, Germanic, Dutch, uh, Swedish people, and then Amapur, which is the Afrikaners. Some Abandu differentiate between the two. I've heard people looking at Afrikaners as not Abelungu, but Amapur. So they've, all of, already, they've become like this kind of identity of their own. So they understood us as a different ethnic group, not necessarily based on color, but based on our Bandu identity, you see. That's why they could work with someone from Lebanon, regardless of how dark their skin is. But they are Lebanese, they know Gucci, they are not the same people. They could work with an Indian, no matter how dark that is, Indians. Uh, you see, like Mahatma Gandhi, there's a lot of black people who are way lighter than him in skin. But these guys worked with Mahatma Gandhi decently, do you get it? So they, they understood that cultural difference and they wanted to make sure that this particular group of people, who have the ability to destroy us, because they fought with all other groups, but then when they came to us, we, we showed them flames. So they knew these people have the ability to destroy us <laughs> one day. So let's give them a subservient. Let's not ignore them. Because if we ignore them, they will thrive in their own value system and culture. Let's bring them in our system and culture. But then let's step upon them now with this so-called boundary education and many other rules. Now, boundary education, and then fast forward to 1976. That was the main, um, you know, youth uprising of the 70s. And it's like the first now instance of student protests. I'm sure there were many others before that, but it's the first one that had so much traction. It, it had so much attention to it, where the police killed unarmed children for refusing to be taught in Afrikaans and refusing to be taught Bandu education altogether. So now you see the first student protest, which is the gist of what we're talking about today, all the way from the missionaries to apartheid to 1976. And it was a very violent and bloody, bloody uh, mess. So they were actually fighting to get European education. They were, unfortunately. Remember, at that time, they had been conquered for a, a, a very significant amount of time. Mm. From the time of the British to 1976, they were already under conquest. They were already slaves, our people. So they thought, at least now, they had accepted that, okay, we are in this system, but at least let's, let's get something out of it. So they, they were indeed fighting for the European education, but a European education that would help them one way or another. They, 
and some of them they didn't even mind the Bantu education. Some, some didn't even mind it. They just didn't want to be taught in Afrikaans. So that's another subject on its own for another day. But the point is that was one of the main uprisings of students. So the, the and it it changed history, man. It changed history. A movie was made out of it called Sarafina. You see, which detailed the story of some of the youths there. We know about Hector Peterson, who was one of the people who were killed. There were many others who were killed that day, but he was one of the people who were killed, and his photo was captured. Sad story. Died very young, with many other peers of his. Now, fast forward from 1976 to the 90s. Now, in the 90s, you see a lot of black people going into these previously white universities. You see, one of them being the University of Cape Town, the other one being the University of Vert Watersrand or Vert University. The other one being Stellenbosch University. Stellenbosch being the center of the, the, the thought behind apartheid. It became like the engine or the war room behind the thought of apartheid. People like Hendrik Vervoet sat down there in Stellenbosch University and devised apartheid. But we know apartheid itself was, more, was a much more occultic and cultic way. It, it came from the secret societies. Apartheid is just a name given to it. Yes. It came from the secret societies. Men who had a plan to be above everyone else. But then the people who went to stand up, the professors were just you know, puppets who were implementing the system. So Stellenbosch University, Tux, which is the University of Pretoria, Nelson Mandela University, Rhodes University, all these universities, they started to see an uprise in terms of the number of black people, because some of these universities were only for whites, and then the only university for blacks was the University of Fort Hare, where Nelson Mandela went, where Robert Mugabe went, and many other freedom fighters. And then you had Vert, you had uh, Stellenbosch for Afrikaners. Now more people started to enter these spaces. I mean, they were already there, there were already black people in those spaces, but I'm saying more like in numbers now. And then you start to see now the imbalance of the economic system that was implemented over the past 350 years. You start to see it at university now. Firstly, there's a very, very, very big cultural shock when you get there because you're not used to this type of life. So the first year for a lot of people becomes extremely difficult now, extremely challenging. The cost of education is so high that you wouldn't even have a chance to pay it off. Now, children, students start to fight and call out to the government that come and help us. We don't afford this. There's too much cost. I'm from Limpopo. I've been accepted to the University of Cape Town. I don't afford the housing there. Please pay for me, Mr. Government. And you see this protest, man, from 1994, 1997, 2004, 2012, they keep on happening. There were protests all those years. It's just that we didn't know about them. They were there, man. And racism was much more rife in those years. Now, back to 2015, during Roads Must Fall, First semester, I think around May, if not end of April, beginning of May, a man called Kuma or Kumani Makwele. I was there on campus the day at UCT. I was there, I saw it with my, both my eyes. Kumani Makwele carries this poti poti or pota pota, whatever that, that thing is called, that bucket. He carries it, he goes to the, the statue there on upper campus, uh, Rhodes, Cecil John Rhodes statue. He goes and pours the poo onto the statue. Hey man, it was smelling so bad. I didn't understand what was going on. I'm fresh from high school. It's my first semester here. And um, I see people starting to study uh, to gather around the statue. And this hashtag came around, roads must fall. It was a much more philosophical than, you know, actual physical issue against the statue itself, but rather what the statue symbolized. Cecil John Rhodes, you know what he did? It was a, he came and stole. You see? Mr. Rhodesia. Exactly. He wanted a plan from Cape to Cairo. He wanted to colonize the whole thing. <laughs> the whole of Africa for himself. So that statue was very symbolic and very in a very powerful position. When you come from lower campus, crossing through middle campus, and you're going up now to the Jemmy Stairs, before you go up the Jemmy Stairs, in the rugby field, what you see is Cecil John Rhodes' statue. He sits like this. So the students were saying, remove this uh, colonial symbol. But for me, that was not the problem. For me, the first thing I saw was when I went to the main library of UCT, there's a hall called Jamison Hall. Actually, there's two residences. Smart, Jan Smart from, named by, from Jan Smart. It's called Smart Hall, a male residence. Then there's another hall called Fuller Hall. 
then when you move beyond those, those halls, you see this main hall called Jamison Hall. All those are colonial names and colonial masters, you see. But leave that alone. Go to the library. As I enter the library, the first thing I see on the wall is a, is a, is a, is a painting of a slave master with a shambok beating up the slave. What the hell is this? This is a university. Why are they allowing this kind of stuff? Apparently, it's art. Move away from that before you enter the library. In the middle of the floor, like at the center of the floor, you see a, a kind of statue of Sarah Bartman, the one they call Sarah Bartman, who, and that's not, her name is not Sarah Bartman. She's from the Gunukwa tribe, in, from Kalekwa, so-called Platinberg Bay area, uh, around the Khamtuos River, which is Kalekwa River. She's from the Gunukwa people there. She was not Sarah Bartman at all, but then they called her that. So I see a statue of this woman they call Sarah Bartman, and it's naked. I'm like, what the hell is going on in this place? I thought this is an institution of higher learning. Why am I seeing a slave master beating a slave on the wall? And why am I seeing a, a, a naked uh, a, a African Aboriginal woman here, man, who was used by these same people? Don't you think maybe they were uh, the people who built those things were actually celebrating what they had done to black people? Dude, they used to celebrate. So what they used to do when they would come ne? and then fight, they would take souvenirs. They would literally cut off people's penises and bums because they were huge in size. They, they had huge bums. You know, we, our women are gifted with a very beautiful gift. Very, very beautiful. And we are gifted as well as the men. <laughs> oh, I mean, I mean, obviously. <laughs> so these guys, they were shocked. But wow, what is this? They would cut off the bums, man. Then they would hang them in their, in their rooms as souvenirs. Literally, they had museums in their back rooms hanging people's penises and bums. I think they still have some... Um, uh, yeah, they, they, they do. Yeah. They would even cut off people's hair. I remember Haile Selassie's hair, the Ethiopian emperor. Mm -hmm. they, they had his hair in Ethiopia, in, in Italy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they used to do that, man. And um, so with, with Sarah Bartman, it was an extension of that. Even to this day, you see it in the hip hop industry, in the music industry. Black women always shaking their bums. It's an extension of that obsession with bums and penises of the black man and the black woman. Anyway, so when I went to UCT, I saw that and Rose Must Fall was addressing that issue. So a lot of people are so quick to judge when students protest. My first initial reaction was to sort of claim that it was barbaric for the guys to protest and disturb everyone. And they did disturb everyone, trust me. The guys would enter a lecture hall, man, step on top of the desk and tell everyone to get out. They would go to our residences. I stayed in a, in a place called College House. Nice residence. They would, ladies, it's a male res, but you'd find ladies banging the doors. Get out, come and join the protest. And I did join. There's a picture, I, I'll try and find it, I was there. So now, Rose Masfall was addressing that, that these symbols are colonial white supremacist symbols. Forget about the economic exclusion. Just this symbolic architectural symbolic um, you know presence on campus is is actually a war and i think that's a good start it's a very good start man it's a terror it causes terror on the aboriginal people the victims people who were previously victims of these uh, 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 colonial uh, you know uh, personalities and therefore roads was removed eh why people are so racist man yo the comment section the comment section uct alumni why uct alumni yo they were so racist they were so racist. It was bad, my brother. I remember when the statue was removed, they left well, the stand upon which the statue was standing. Then they put some kind of a uh, cover on it. And people were allowed to go write comments there. Yo! Yeah. One of the comments was like, you can take the monkey out of the bush, but then you can't take the bush out of the monkey. That's what they said about us. They said that we are monkeys and they're taking us out of the bush by taking us to university with slave masters statues all over. When you complain about those slave master statues, then you are, you are being a monkey now. So for you to be civilized, you must accept the oppressor. So it's not even about them trying to insult you. They want to guilt trip you to accept their slavery. It's like that whole mindset of saving you whilst oppressing you. They are like that. The moment you tell the truth, they will come, ah, you never built anything in this world. Ah, oh, you never invented anything. When you invented everything, in fact. So that was Rosemar's fall. But in the same year, man, after Rose Must Fall, there was Fizz Must Fall, which was even bigger now. Now, Fizz Must Fall was joined by UCT, Vets, UJ, TUT, 
All universities, I think all universities were part of fees must fall. It, it feels, this fees, the, the fees fall. Yeah, fall. that's where I'm going, my brother. Which is why even today there's a protest at VEDS, there's a protest at NMU and other universities. Fees must fall, the idea was to stop the fee hikes year after year. And some of these fee hikes are higher than inflation. You have about 6, 6, 6% to 65 of inflation. And those fees increase by 10.5%, 11%, 14%. I don't know the figures, but I know in one particular year, I think that year, it was 10.5%. From this year, 10.5% more expensive. Man, the, just tuition alone, my brother. You know how much I had to pay in my first year? The bus we had to pay. Mm. More than 150,000 rand. And I, I think now the protest is about that uh, NSFAS wants to give them, I think, 80% of the, of the um, tuition fees. Mm. So, Where are they going to get the 20? So they are saying, if you're going to give us 80%, then the fees must, must, must be equal to eight, the 80% that you're giving <laughs> us. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, man. So and it's war. Yeah, it is war. Because, you see, when fees must all started, that was the fight, right? That was the fight that these fees keep on increasing. People don't have housing. Man, there's a lot of things going on at universities. Just besides the fees, like the housing issue, my brother. You've got kids coming from the Eastern Cape, man, coming from KZN, stranded in Cape Town. Every year, taken by old men, because these men have houses, they've got money to feed them. They're taken by these men, taken advantage by these men. It happens, my brother. It happens. Some of these kids, they can't even afford food. And I'm not saying all these kids are victims, but they are those who are victims. They don't afford. So they need to find someone to take care of them. And it doesn't come for free. There's no such a thing as a free lunch. That's what they taught us in Economics 101. So, you have a minister called uh, Bladen Zimande. You know what he said when students were protesting? That guy was, he was laughing. Whilst he's driving a 1 million rand BMW that year, it's probably 5 million now. He was laughing that students must fall. <laughs> he's laughing. And he doesn't realize how depressing the situation is for a lot of these students. Because a lot of these students, they are the only hope for their families. They're the only hope for their mothers and fathers. Their parents can't even afford to give them money for food on a month-to-month -month basis. This is all or nothing for them. And this guy has the time to laugh while driving his lavish cars. A so-called communist driving lavish cars in the face of poverty in this country. So, when these students protest, man, it may be easy to label them as being chaotic, as being unruly, as being uh, barbaric. It's fine, label them that. Everyone is in your comfortable... Uh, your views are valid, yeah. but those students are not going to stop, and they shouldn't stop. I'm not saying people should burn stuff. I'm not saying people shouldn't burn stuff. People see their condition, and if there's an amicable way to deal with it, then they should deal with it. But then sometimes, especially in South Africa, you know authorities are not going to listen to you when you submit a petition. You submit 10 petitions, things are not going to change. The rich will keep on having access to all the best resources in this country. And the poor and talented, remember, this is not just about poor people. These are poor, talented and deserving, hardworking students who should, be, who should be having access to education 30 years after democracy. We shouldn't be having this situation. In UJ, man, in UJ, there's a bunch of kids who don't have money, they don't have food. On a daily basis, they have to go to a kitchen somewhere. They're on campus. Gift of the givers is feeding those kids. And you're telling me that we're living in, in, in a democratic country. Huh? Year after year, man, this government keeps on showing and, you know, spitting on the face of our people, the elderly, the young, but in this particular case, the students. So, fees must fall. People fought for it, 2015. It, it went over to 2016, right? 2016, I think it was even worse, man, especially in Gauteng. Hey, I saw police vans burning. Hey, it was going down, man, 2016. And then 2017... Um, I think that was Zuma's final year, right, in office. Just before he left office, Zuma declared that there would be free education. So I think he said that NSFAS would become a bursary now instead of a loan. Because what NSFAS used to do is that there would, there would be a loan, then you have to pay them back. And I think if you pass well, then it would be a bursary, something like that. That was the initial arrangement. But then under Zuma, he said that NSFAS would become a bursary now. So you didn't have to pay it back. And not just a bursary, but they also gave food allowances, which was a good thing to do, you see. Do you think Zuma maybe was um, somewhat a key 
to uh, many of our our of the socio economic issues that we are facing in, in our country. a key cause or a key what um a key to open doors in terms of helping out yes yeah, absolutely man i mean he he was obviously not a perfect man but i i i can definitely see say that under him there was direction in the country even ideologically we had conversations we had direction uh, look under Zuma, man, you know, people were talking about free education, which was the initial promise of the ANC. People were talking about land, which was the initial promise of the ANC. That conversation was happening. And he made some actions, obviously not immediately. Even himself, he had his own issues. He didn't do these things immediately. But there was, there was motion in the country, man. There was a, a president. You could see BRICS. You see, he was, South Africa was an active member, a very active member in the BRICS. Um, confederation, you see. We're not just a symbolic member of the BRICS confederation. We're actually, you know, even in parliament, the kind of conversations were happening, like Jan van Riebeek, he was mentioned in parliament. Jan van Riebeek came, it's because of him. In parliament, you'll never hear that under Ramaphosa. And under yeah, Zuma, you I didn't hear, that, yeah, yeah under, under Zuma, you didn't hear white people saying that black people should be killed and people should, should get all the love in the world. Under Zuma, you didn't have black people, white people strangling kids and throwing them into pools. And I, I heard, uh, I was listening to another in, um, um, speech that he did. He was actually actually mentioning that um, the government doesn't have power. Um, they can't even set the price of bread. Yeah, you that's know, true. It's determined for them. If they yeah, say that's true. bread is 20 rands, that's true. you accept it. You have to listen to the Rothschilds mm. or you get cut off. But yeah, man, so I think 2017, 2018, Zuma then declared that NSFAS would be a bursary. Then things changed for a bit, you see. Things were much calmer, students went to school. Now, 2019, I think there were protests, 2020 protests, 2021. Do you think maybe um, um, one of the reasons, that's one of the reasons why he was removed from his position? I'm not sure, but I know he, so... Because they accused him of stealing uh, money, but he's not arrested at all. Which he probably did steal, because they all steal, including Julius Malima. But why isn't VBS. he arrested at all if he stole? I don't know, man. And he was chased out of office because of that. Mm. So they chased him out because he stole Nganda money, right? Mm. He was, uh, Julius Malema was very instrumental in the pay back the money, hashtag pay back the money. But now he's friends with him. Yeah, that's politics for you, man. But even Julius, I get it, he was, uh, you know, in, um, the VBS looting scheme. And even Ramaphosa, when he stole with the Bosasa thing and his, his son stealing with the Bosasa and Palapal. All these guys, man, they are thieves and criminals, man. All of them. Because even, even Tabombe, he, he had issues with ARVs and HIV. Like, it's a mess, my brother. And there was the arms deal. What about Mandela? He, he was involved in the arms deal. He's, he's the original friend of the Guptas, by the way. Mandela is the original friend of the Guptas. Not just the Guptas, even the lords of London. Hey, let's not even get to it, man. Let's get back to protest. But, but I think it's part of, of this conversation. Yes, but I wanna, I, I wanna, I wanna. He's the uh, the one who initialized some of the policies that we. Yes, we will address that. Let Let's yeah. get back to because I wanted to give a history of how we move from missionary schools up to 2023, and kids are still protesting. So from 2017, 18, there was a bit of a calm, right? People started getting um, allowances and all that. Now what you see is that. Universities keep on increasing the fees and then universities start to hire black vice chancellors so as to alleviate the race issue. Because when we protested at UCT, the vice chancellor was a white man, Dr. Max Price, a very open minded man, by the way. We engaged with that guy, man. He was even punched in the face, I think maybe once or twice, I'm not sure. <laughs> hey, they dealt with him. Hey, but he was very, he's not a coward, you see. Like, you see, those deeply educated people who are ready to go, you see, he was like that, man. And then now they hired black vice chancellors. And then it became a bit difficult now for the kids to break through, you see. Because now there's a black person in power. They're not going to run away from you. They'll come and address you quickly. I know, they're still sorting it out. I saw it at UJ. The professor was Chilizi Marwala. And this guy, man, he just laughed. He was there drinking... With the, I remember this one event, he was busy drinking with the Chinese, the red eyes, drinking wine. 
and the workers are protesting outside. <laughs> like, what the hell is going on? He's having a good time, man. He's not even concerned. Because he knows they're not going to do anything. You see, there's bouncers from Fidelity in the, in the campus. So they started hiring these black vice chancellors. You see it at UJ, you see it at UCT, you see it at VETS. They have black vice chancellors. Hmm, which is interesting. Because back then at, U at VETS, they had, uh, who was this? Habib, Adam Habib. I think, I think that's his name. You had Habib and then you had Max Price there. Then you had Rensberg at UJ during those previous protests. So I think universities realized that, ah, uh, let's put the, 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 the black people in front now. The kids will deal with them. Same thing you did in protest. We did that actually at UCT. So when we were protesting, I remember we had to go to, went to Rondebosch police station because they had taken some of uh, the protesters there. And then when, when going to, yeah, when going to parliament, the white kids were put in front because you could see the police are ready to shoot. So the white kids were put in front like, ah, uh -uh, let the white kids go in front so that even if we get shot, you know, the black police will be afraid of shooting the whites. Hey, hey, they will die. These ones, they are soft. You see? <laughs> that's the reality. Yeah, that's, that, that's the reality of South Africa, man. So, so those protests passed, but they've been happening in the recent years. Up to today, at, at VEDS, where kids are protesting, at NMU, kids are protesting. They're not getting their allowances. They're not getting their book allowances. They're not getting their food allowances. And I don't know why NSFAS would take so long, man, to assist kids with something as simple as putting the money in their account. It's March already, man. Why are they taking so long? So, now, that's one side of the story. Where kids are being, are at a very, very serious disadvantage just, because of the yeah. historical structure of this country. Just, just a quick question, bro. Um, man, just lost you lost your question. No, it's fine. You'll think about it. But that's one side of the story. There's another side of the story now where... Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I was just, I just wanted to ask, man, um, do you think these um, black leaders that are put in place and, you know, the government itself um, in a macro level, that do they have, like, um, power to, to exercise, you know, and to make decisions and to help uh, black people or do, are they controlled? by external parties. They do have power, man. I know it's popular to say they are controlled by outside parties. They do have power. They do have power. They, why, why is it that um, every every um, African president must sit with um, a, 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 a multimillionaire guy from Because they from understand France, the consequences of not doing that. Guy from, um, ir, uh, what, uh, they know Ireland. the consequences of not doing that. They understand the consequences. You don't exist in your own little economy. The guys who refuse to see to those guys are dead today. Where's Muammar Gaddafi? Where's Fidel Castro? Where's Hussein Suleiman? Where are they? Where's this guy, uh, Pumba? Uh, this guy was the leader, leader of um, Tanzania. He was, he was against the COVID thing. He's gone. Where is he? He refused to follow the orders. So he had power and he exercised it and he's dead now. They are, these guys know, my brother. So they do have the choice. They can choose to exercise their constitutional power, which means that they have the highest power in the land because they're the president. But then they know that there's a shadow government now. There's hidden hands somewhere that will... You'll, you'll have men in black suits. Yeah, you'll have men in black suits coming to visit you. Even Vladimir Putin mentioned it, that he's been with various American presidents who have brilliant ideas for America. But then once they get voted in, a man, a group of men in black suits visit them with, with a briefcase and give them, this is how it, it's done, get my brother. You choose to obey or will, will, John, will, will J.F. Kennedy you? But why do you think this is only done um, predominantly like in Africa? No, not just in Africa, everywhere. Because uh, um, they, I don't think they do it to the Chinese. I don't think they do it to the Japanese. I don't think they do it to the uh, France people, the French and... No, no, know, no, 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 look, man, look. The only... Do you know about the yellow vest protests in France? Do you know how long that those yellow vest protests took? The, in France, the guy who's in, in the office is already a puppet. Do you understand? He's already a puppet. The guy, the Canadian Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, is already a puppet. These guys were implementing hard lockdowns on their citizens, man, by force. The citizens are like, we don't want a lockdown. Look at China right now. 
Do you think a government who's in the right mind, who cares about these people, would do that in Hong Kong? Have you seen what the drones are doing there? Forcing people to stay indoors. It should tell you already that what happens in China is that majority of the people in government are in agreement in terms of the agenda. Whereas here in Africa, we don't agree with the agenda. So now we are against it. Even some people who are in politics are against the agenda. And therefore there's a lot of friction, you see. But in, in France, it's not like that. A lot of the people who are in office in France, they agree with the agenda. They, are, they were actually installed in the, even in the UK, man. You think that prime minister guy is, is going to do anything different than the previous one? They were all installed, including the royal family. But to not digress from the main objective, which is to, to, to maybe understand why this protest thing keeps on continuing. I've given a history of how protests have been going on in this country. And at the core of this protest is economic imbalance. This country is the most unequal society in the world. Black people are poor. 60% of black people live in poverty. The average white family is five times wealthier than the average black family. In Cape Town, majority of black people still travel by bus when they go to the Eastern Cape, whereas majority of white travel by airplane. Maybe there's more white people traveling by bus recently because of the economic conditions. But the standard is that majority of this particular group of people travel by bus. And that, that's, that's, those are just some of the indicators. Those are just some of the indicators, you know, showing us the economic imbalance. And if you look at the Gini coefficient, which is an economic indicator that's used globally, South Africa has, is number one in terms of inequality. So you see it translates now to situations at university. Some kids in first year, they drive Ford Rangers, man. Ford door Ford Rangers. Whereas other kids, they, they don't even have money for toiletries. In one, the same class, same class. Some kids for lunch, they will go to a restaurant. Whereas others have to think about where to get their next meal. Man, some of the kids have to go to attend various events at university because there's free food. They have to come with a lunchbox and collect the food in those, free, those events. So at the core of this whole thing is economic imbalance. And now it connects to what you were saying about Nelson Mandela and the policies that he implemented with his friends, Tabumbeki, Jacob Zuma, Cyril Ramaphosa. They are all friends, man. I don't care who people like and who people don't like. Ramaphosa, Jacob Zuma, Nelson Mandela, Tabumbeki are all the same thing. Because under them, we are in this situation that we are in right now. It's under them, my brother. They accepted whatever they did accept Apparently, on our behalf. Some people say that um, Nelson Mandela was not even in prison for 27 years. Nah, obviously, he wasn't. No, it's public. In, okay, it's not public, but it's there. He wasn't. There's a video of him in 1990, man. This guy is there, chowing salad, there, watching TV, lying in bed, in a nice house in the, in the suburbs in 1990. 1990, Baba. Hey. This guy, or oh, 1989, I'm not sure. But anyway, man, the economic policies that these guys implemented didn't help the, the majority of the people in this country. That's why you have this condition now where 60% of black people are what? Are poor, and 40% of colored people are poor. And it translates to university. That, regardless of the talent, no matter how talented you are, you can get seven distinctions, eight distinctions. You don't have access to the internet. You couldn't even apply for a bursary. There are many kids like that, man. There are many kids who got distinctions. I know one personally got distinctions, didn't have access to other resources. They didn't even know about some bursaries. When I went to university, I was, I was sponsored by the Ellen Gray Opis Foundation. But I didn't know about it. A teacher of mine came with it. You see, there are kids whose teachers don't even know about Ellen Gray. So there's a lot, man, that this economic imbalance, it results in. But then at the core is the economic imbalance and the people who are supposed to address it, which is the government. They are supposed to promote small businesses. They are supposed to promote business ownership in the country. They are supposed to promote entrepreneurship in the country. They are supposed to promote addressing the issues instead of creating billionaires through their PEE schemes and nepotism and tender, tendering, or whatever that nonsense of tenders is. They are supposed to help the majority of people get out of poverty. When people get out of poverty, they'll be able to pay their fees. That, and those are just the poor kids. You have the missing middle kids. The kids who earn, who's, who's their how, con, combined household income is more than 350,000 rand a year. 350,000 rand a year is like, uh, I think, 30,000 rand a month. 30,000 rand a month is nothing, man. You are, you are a parent, you earn 30,000 rand a month and you have three kids. That's nothing. You can never send a child to university. But then NSFAS doesn't fund those ones. They are called the missing middle. You see? 350,000 rand to 600k a year, I think so, I'm not sure. They are called the missing middle. Even them, the, those are the children of professionals. Even some of them, they are poor, I mean, they can't, they can't afford university. They, they study with study loans. And when they finish, 
there's a high level of youth and uh, graduate unemployment, which is another issue on its own, which which links back to this highly unemployed youth of South Africa. So these protests, man, if we want them to end, unfortunately, it's going to take a long, a long approach, which needs the addressing of economic issues. But then now on the other side, students need to pass, man. Students need to pass. Some students are not serious, man, about school. They go there, they party every weekend. They think they are, they are rich or something. They must realize that they are poor, man. Majority of students at universities are poor. I don't care if your mother is a teacher or a nurse. You are poor, my friend. If she still needs to wake up in the morning and go to work, if she doesn't go to work, you guys will go hungry. You are from a poor family. Those things of middle class and what what, they are not real. Forget about them. You are poor. You are a poor person. Accept it. And therefore, you can't play when you, when you do get funding, whether it's a private bursary or it's a government bursary like NSFAS, you have to pass, guys. So do you think this um, economic inequality might lead to some um, political unrest? It's not going to lead to political unrest. We are in political unrest already. It's already there. It's been there since the, the 90s, since the 80s, actually. It's just getting worse now. Do you know how many protests are there in a day in South Africa? I mean, every day there's a protest. Yeah, the news don't show it. Every single day there is a protest in this country, which means South Africa is a, is a risk in terms of so-called foreign investment. It's a risk every day, man. So what that does, that political instability, that's our name. It's normal now. Look at load shedding. Every day you lose about six, four to eight hours of electricity you don't have. Roads, people have to pay huge amounts of money because their cars hit the potholes, you see? ESCOM, dead. Prasa, dead. SAA, dying. All these parastatal state-owned entities are dying. And these are supposed to be helping the people who are poor. So what you see is that we are in political unrest. We are in economic unrest and economic instability. Even the rich, or those who were rich 15 years ago, are poor now. Yeah, more and more people are becoming poor in this country. Even if salaries are still are increasing, inflation is even higher. There's someone who wants everything to themselves. Oh my goodness. It's, it's bad, man. So, to conclude my, my point on the protest, I think it's easy when people ride on their high horses and assume that the kids who are protesting are just barbaric fools who have a criminal mind. No, no, it's not. Sometimes it's not even that. Some, a lot of the times, those, those reasons are very valid. The methods may not be conventional. The methods may be a bit unorthodox, the methods of protest. But the reasons are valid are deeply structural even, deeply, deeply structural. So the protests are still going to continue and they should continue so until these issues are addressed. However, there's responsibility as well from the students. They need to study hard, man. They need to work hard. I know not all students are going to fit into this category, but some students must need, need to make money on campus. You know, I had to tutor first year. When I was doing my first year, I had to get a tutoring job. I had to tutor maths somewhere in Bramfontein. Um, I was tutoring uh, metric kids, the metric rewrites in the school there. I had to because I needed the cash. In the, in the second year, I had to sell textbooks on campus, you know, be a middleman of some sort because I needed the cash and I managed to survive. So sometimes it needs that as well. You need to activate your solution mindset and not always cry about Just everything. Like yes, activate your solution mindset. Think about solutions. Yes, you want to go to the authorities, you want to address them, but then that's not the only thing you can do. There are many other viable options for some of the people. I know a guy who used to sell chips, like uh, snacks. He used to sell cheap snacks. Another one he used to sell um, cigarettes and, and lollipops. A guy used to sell that. By the time I left, bro, the at, dude had a car already. Look at DJ Smoo, bro. He was selling uh, on the robots. Yeah, exactly. Like Mofi, uh, exactly. Mofi, 10 rand. Exactly. <laughs> Sometimes he was even <laughs> selling... Some, sometimes he was even selling stones and, and empty <laughs> bottles. Yeah, he, he's just trying to show you that you can do it. So, my, my point is there are many solutions, man. Some solutions you can apply for yourself in your environment. You don't have to cry all the time. But then now, at, at a macroeconomic level, yes, authorities need to be scrutinized. They need to be put to the test. They need to be uh, addressed, you know. Now, I'm not saying the methods of addressing. I'm not saying those are the perfect methods. But then sometimes, you know, Things are just situational. You see a vent bending somewhere. You see a window broken. You don't know how it got broken, but it did get broken. I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing either. I don't know. There's reasons why it happens. But it's easy to point a finger and say, those kids are barbaric. Trust me, they are not. 
they've got valid reasons why they should protest and I think they should continue protesting but also they should study very hard when they're at university forget about partying, forget about my piano DJ Maporisa is not going to help you guys DJ Maporisa and all these other my piano guys, forget about them you'll figure them out once you start working because I think a lot of other kids they just don't have a backbone, they can't focus they really can't focus first year already they're behaving like they're in third year or whatever and there are guys who've been there for like four years, five years already they're not, they don't, they don't want to leave university man those are the kind of things that we need to f fix you see you could, because that guy is taking someone's space, man. There's a, there's a kid with five distinctions who needs that space. I think the minute they make it to university, they think that they have made it. Ah. Because I think that thing of uh, Far going from it. to university has um, a certain status connected yes, to it's like it. a prestigious thing to do. Yes. There's a privilege that comes with it. Yes. Well, I mean, there is obviously a, 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 an amount of elitism at university. You have access to things that the average person will never have access to in their entire lifetime. But it's not, it's not the end of the world. I mean, it's not even guaranteed to help you succeed in life, especially these days, you see, depending on the industry you are in as well. So, because some people are there doing safety management or whatever, things that they don't even want to use those degrees in their real life. So, and I'm not trying to, you know, shun people's degrees or whatever, but there's also an importance of understanding why you are there in the first place. Some people are there, man, for three years. They live the same way they came. They are still that typical guy from the township. Hey, there was a guy that I, we used to go to together, to university together. Aye, that guy, man. I think it was from the Northwest. Yo, uh -uh. You see, those are the kind of people who are not going to get jobs. He needs to go through some reprogramming first. Even the way he speaks, even the way he talks. You can see, like, you'll never trust him. You can't trust that guy, man. He doesn't look like a criminal, eh? He looks like a crook. Mm. Yeah, like, there's a criminal, a dangerous person. He doesn't look dangerous. Mara, yo, you can see, this guy, he will chow you, man. Mm. Uh, he will betray you at any chance he gets. You can't leave him alone. You can't, exactly. So, and he may not even be like that, but because of the, the image that he... He presents, even the way he speaks. Do you think maybe as people, we actually judge people based on their images? Particularly, especially when you haven't really experienced them in a, for a significant period of time. We do judge them based on image. It's just how it is, man. I understand it. When I go to an interview, I, I, I speak in a certain kind of way, depending on the industry. If it's an interview in the insurance industry, there's a certain jargon that I'm going to use. If it's an interview in the tech industry, there's a certain dress code that I'm going to wear and then there's a certain, you know, hairstyle I'm going to do so that those people can identify with me. So when people take your image and then it's related to something else, for example, you walk like this, you know, it's para para vibes, you see, you can't trust this person. But someone who speaks like, like me in a very serious and articulate way, you have to take them seriously because this guy is owning the space. This guy, is he knows what he's talking about, you see. Sometimes I'm even less qualified than the other guy, but I get the job because of how I sell myself. Basically, this is sales, man. It's how you're selling. So your image is literally your branding and packaging. And then your, your speech, body language, that's what we call marketing. So it's sales. You're selling yourself. Life is about selling yourself. The people who are watching this video is because they are sold to the idea that I'm putting forward. So guys, when kids are protesting, if there's a way to support them, please support them. Give them water, give them sandwiches. Give them lunch. And to the students, guys, keep on fighting. I know it's very tough at university. But also be careful not to be, don't lose focus. You know you're doing computer science. You know you need to study Python, JavaScript, C Sharp, C++. Go and practice. Don't waste your time in some protest somewhere. You can support them ideologically, but you don't have to be there. You know you're doing actuarial science. You need to go and learn uh, contingency methods. You need to go and learn life and risk. You need to go and learn... Uh, financial maths, go and do that. You're doing accounting. You need to go and do some taxation stuff. You know how demanding your degree is. You have to stay focused as well because that's another thing I saw. A lot of students during the fees must fall. They defer their exams to the next year and they didn't even come back to university. So it goes both ways, guys. As much as there's entitlements and rights and, 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 and things that you guys deserve, you also need to put in the work and action. And uh, love you guys. Peace.